cuckoldry, Eli, you boy. Drained dry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Here, if you have a girlfriend, and I have a girlfriend, mm -hmm. and I have a cock. There it is. That's the cock. You see? Watch it. Oh, now, we don't want to. my cock reaches across uh. the room and starts to <laughs> fuck your girlfriend. No. I fuck your girlfriend. <laughs> I knock her up. So many possible worlds, but we got this one. So many possible worlds, but we got this one. Welcome to the Worst of All Possible Worlds, the first and only pre-scripted podcast. I'm the Worst mm. of All Possible Josh's. <laughs> I'm the worst of all possible Brian's and AJ is not here as he is currently just underneath the surface of the ocean <laughs> with a slightly larger than average snorkel just uh -huh. swimming just swimming around he's just hanging out and it's yeah. good we, we 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 could have pulled him out uh but we didn't want to because no, because he's... I fuck your girlfriend I was gonna say it's because he's having so much fun but yeah he could be under the sun yeah I was trying to be under light. the water uh, I was trying to be light. I was trying to be happy with it. Uh, and, and you went somewhere well, you know so much darker. You know who is light? Oh, God. A one Mr. Daniel Plainview yeah? <laughs> and his son, H.W. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, we're actually not talking about There Will Be Blood today. No, um, no. Instead, we There have, will be come. That, <laughs> uh, there actually will be blood, though, now that I there think about be. it. There will be. Like quite a bit. We uh, are talking this week about the surprise drama twist uh, visual novel Doki Doki Literature Club. Yeah. Uh, which was originally released uh, as a free-to-play thing back in, like, I don't know, 2015 or something like later, that? Later. Later than that. No, this is what really shocked me, and this is what really <laughs> kind of changed my attitude on this game after playing it, was I for some reason, remember this game coming out when I was in college. Yeah. Like, I could swear yeah. to God it was, like, 2012. I can see the house that I used to live in that also Anne used to live in. Hi, also, Anne is here. Anne's here again. Oh, hi. You'll remember <laughs> Anne from our episode where we talked about Marble Hornets and, more importantly, talked about Ong's hat. <laughs> we talked a lot about a yeah. lot to do and with I it. And I felt like I had played the game there. Sure. But I didn't. I guess maybe someone from college had messaged me mm. when this game came out, which was 2017. That's not by right. the way. That feels right. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which I guess was a long time ago now, but it not, was. But like I was really thinking it was more than 10 years and it's in fact less. Huh. And I played a very small amount and I was like, this feels like something you need to play all at once. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give it the time where I can play it all at once. And then that never happened until this week. Yeah. Um, and were you into visual novels at all uh, ever? Like, was that your not remotely? Okay. I have played a few visual novels. They were almost universally pornographic <laughs> <laughs> and almost universally were free browser games right, using games. Macromedia Flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Newgrounds games and shit like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and what about you? What was your experience with visual novels? I think up until this game, fairly limited. And I think similar to Brian also, I played, yeah, the first like couple days that you get through, I thought it was just, I don't even think I knew it was a horror game. And I think that was maybe okay. before. See, I, I wasn't paying I attention to the know. Steam tags, yeah. maybe. I don't I, know. I knew that like there, everyone had there been writing about weird. it. There had been pictures on articles where it's like, oh yeah, here's like a corpse or something. So yeah. like I knew that, that there was supposed to be some turn and I was like, that turn's going to come someday. <laughs> I don't know when. And then before I throw it back to you, Anne, I should note to our listeners, this game, much like other games that we've talked about, such as Outer Wilds, is a game that... A lot of its effect is pretty heavily dependent on you not knowing the twists. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, you know, if you've played the game, uh, I hope you enjoy this walk down memory lane. If not, you know, feel free to keep listening. We are going to spoil pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have some fun with it. Anyway, bet, bet, back to you. Visual novels. I did play Hot to Feel Boyfriend. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got a couple okay. of endings on that because I am attracted to pigeons yeah so wasn't hot, going in am now because in hot hotful boyfriend yeah it's just photographs of pigeons it's just like real pigeons right uh, correct yeah, yeah with like anime drawn backgrounds and then like when it introduces each of the romanceable pigeons there's also then like an anime boy drawn oh to, oh. to, to suggest sort of what the 
I think it accurately su- helps suggest like what the type of boy it is. Sure. Or also, you can also like romance you, the teacher. <laughs> and, and you, there is but, a setting where you can just keep the little anime guys on rather oh, really? than look at the birds. I think. Which well, is, why would you do that? If you're sense. a fucking coward, you might do uh, yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Well, that's the thing is like there are a lot of um, visual novel meme games. What I didn't realize about Hotful Boyfriend is that it's actually Japanese. Yes. Uh, it's not an American riffing which doki doki literature club is an american making a game but hot full boyfriend is actually from japan i i think it's just like i don't know everyone spun the wheels so much on visual novels it's like what's the next thing that we can do and mm-hmm. it's just getting zany with it while keeping the writing pretty much just normal it's to just birds yeah. or it's like boats or something like that yeah. oh yeah i forgot about the one with the boat boats. Yeah. Yeah. Hotful boyfriend yeah. was did come out the time that i thought Doki Doki came so out. So that was, was like 2011. 20... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. But like this is far more recent. And it, it, so like I was putting together a lot of notes about like, oh yeah, because you had like Undertale, which was before this. You had Pony Island. Yeah. There yeah. were a lot of games that are about games mm-hmm. that are sort of breaking all of this stuff open. And they're also making you interact with them in a way that sometimes exists outside of the game itself. Right. Yeah, this is part of a sort of with PC games sort of within this, I guess, five ish year span between, let's say, 2012 to 2017. um, There was this big idea of what if some of the gameplay was about what it means to, as you were saying, Brian, interact with a game. Yeah. Um, And so a lot of very self-aware writing, a lot of fourth wall breaking. You mentioned Pony Island. That's one where it appears to just be this little arcade game. But. Uh, it turns out that much darker forces are at play and, you know, the computer starts talking to you and stuff like that. Yeah, And it turns out you were in the Crusades for some reason. Right. Um, <laughs> or, or the follow up game to that, which was the Hex, uh, yeah. as well a as the follow up to that one, Inscription. Inscription. All of those games, which are fun. And we'll probably talk about one, at least one of those at some yeah. point. I, I, I personally, I really like Pony Island and I, I really adored Inscription. Inscription is fucking great. But again, the the key thing with these games is. Yes, you are playing a game that has certain genre or narrative conventions that you are familiar with, and it sort of lulls you into this false sense of security where it's like, okay, I know where things are going. And then at some point it hits you with a twist that recontextualizes everything that came before. And sometimes, I mean, the typical place to go is horror, like even Undertale, which people kind of associate with just like a lot of nice things has a very strong horror element, yeah. even if you're not doing the genocide path. No, but I mean, if you do, boy, it is. And then if it, you do it, yeah, it goes Genuinely one crazy. of the bleakest experiences I've ever had in gaming. You actually did it? Doing the genocide okay. one, yeah. And I wish yeah. I hadn't, genuinely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's rare. It's rare that I've had that reaction with a game where it's like, but the, again, like to the point of what it's yeah. trying to do narratively, in Undertale, it presents an option to you that's like, if you want to kill every single NPC in the game, you can. And it's going to make you feel really fucking bad about it. And Undertale does this delineation between the player and the player character that you don't know about for a long time, right? You you enter a name and then you never see that name again. And then you find out the name of the protagonist is different than the right. name that you entered right. at the beginning, which is drawing as well off of Suda 5-1 and his game Contact, which doesn't go quite as dark, but it does end with the protagonist of the game saying like, hey, I know you're out there. I know you've been trying to control me this whole time. And he tries to break through your DS screen and you just keep tapping him with oh, the cool. stylus until he falls over. I like that. And then you feel like a real asshole. <laughs> um, so I, I know this because I'm the only person to ever get to the end of contact because most <laughs> people just kind of got sick of it. Another thing that Undertale did was it tricks you with the way the save system works because there's two different save systems happening. There are the saves that you enter manually, and then there's the automatic saving yes. that happens as well. That's actually very important to um, the underlying features of the game, which is also happening in Doki Doki Literature. Exactly. Club. Yeah, they, because it's sort of tricking you again. It's this idea that like there is safety when you save. When you yeah. save, it means that you have you know committed everything you played up until that point. And nothing outside of what you committed has saved. Yeah. And you'll always be able to go back. And it turns out in both Undertale and Doki Doki Literature Club, that's a fucking lie. Mm-hmm. The you game, don't really have a choice. No, yeah. you don't <laughs> have all. a choice. And the game is uh, doing stuff in the background that it is not making you aware of. Yeah. And that's that's the other interesting thing about the genocide run in Undertale right. is that if you do that and then play the good version of the game, you get the worst ending. Right. 
instead of just getting the good ending. Yeah, you get no, the, the you, thing that's it, like dooms everyone. Yep, because you know you have made these choices, and you know choices matter, right? Choices this is, matter. This is a this is a big thing <laughs> in video games: the idea of like your choice mattering in some meaningful yeah. way. And again, there was this big, and I remember this like this meta narrative discourse that was so big in the mid 2010s yeah. because people I think were getting really sick of what it was that games were doing and nobody had fully charted what the future could look like. And so things felt very stuck in a rut, which is I think why we got a lot of these big narrative experiments, yeah. especially in PC gaming. Oh, another one, another one that I was just thinking of year walk where um, again, it's that one's a horror game from the start. It's not mm -hmm. a horror game underneath it, but it's a game where you actually have to start the game over and then find a place to end it in like the first five minutes. That's sort of a common okay. thing. It's sort of like, you know, in Mist, if you know the answer, you can get right to the end. If you're playing Riven, the end is literally on that first screen right, right there. Right. Of course, you won't get a good ending if you don't accomplish all the tasks. But this is like drawing things out. So like some of these games have an actual meta element where you go into the programming of the game itself. And some of them have a simulated element that is still like Pony Island. You're always reprogramming mm. the game. Year Walk, you're kind of playing it on a computer. And then like there's this background character, sort of the background of you, the player that is like a researcher in the modern day who's kind of finding a way to time travel using this uh, research that he's doing on Year Walks. Yeah, everyone is, is really playing around with this idea of, oh, everything can change. And actually, the answer is right in front of you and you don't know it yet. I think the 2000s saw we talked about this with JRPGs when we had Trevor on and talked about Dark Souls, how Japanese RPGs found themselves in a really solid rut. Mm -hmm. um, tutorials were getting weirdly long. Uh, everything was just kind of the same. But it was also happening in Western games. Yeah. Right. It was also like everything got consoleized in the 2000s. So if even if you were making a PC game, it was like, well, how can we turn it into like a three dimensional action game, whether it's first person or third person? It's going to be it's going to be that it's going to be a shooter or it's going to be over the shoulder and it's going to be hack and slash if it's over the shoulder. And once we get into the 2010s, we get more people playing on PC again. We get more games that are compatible for Mac mm -hmm. uh, and we just have this explosion of indie developers as chronicled in the famous indie game. Yes. The movie. Yes. Including fan favorite <laughs> Jonathan Blow. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. And Phil Fish, who also everybody loves. Yeah. yeah. I guess this is something I just wanted to go back to real quick because, you know, yeah. the thing that bonds all of us together is our experience in college. And I know that. We were all bullshitting around and playing a lot of computer games at that time, too. Yeah. Uh, sometimes irresponsibly. So. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes backstage before you were supposed to go on know. stage. Yeah. You never know. You got to um, kill the time somehow. Exactly. Yeah. I still remember Anne and their uh, 16th century maid outfit playing <laughs> Amnesia <laughs> the <laughs> Dark Descent <laughs> between scenes. Dressed up as Queen Anne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't, I waited to put the wig on because it was uncomfortable. So it was That's the right. huge it's fucking like pearls and like yeah, 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 and uh, and and just going, oh fuck, oh <laughs> fuck, oh fuck, in the wings, just getting chased by invisible shit. Yeah, but why if you've we, played that game? Well, yeah. I mean, speaking of amnesia, right? Let's yeah. talk. Let's talk about horror games a little bit. Yeah, because Doki Doki Literature Club is one of those. The thing that's really interesting about horror is just how subjective it is. And with games, it's even more so because a game like Amnesia, the Dark Descent doesn't get to me as much because I just get very annoyed with it once it starts getting difficult. Just like the mechanics and like yeah, actually the plane like of it dying over and over and over. Yeah. Again. So like if it's a hard horror game, I just stop being scared and I just get pissed off. Sure. And most horror games are hard, which is why it's fun to come across like a visual novel or Amnesia Machine for Pigs, a walking simulator where it's full of scary shit. But you get to keep going the same way as like when a scary thing happens in a movie, the movie still continues forward. Yeah. So for me, I think that's that's something I need is the is the knowledge that I can get through it because so many horror games are very, very hard. Yes. Well, I'm thinking of like um, Dead Space, mm. too, that it is I, that can be a, a pretty difficult game. Yeah. My first horror game thinking about it was. Probably Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem. Oh, another game that breaks the fourth wall in a lot Absolutely. of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. So when I was playing Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem, that's a somewhat difficult game because the mechanics are a little funny. 
but it's it was the first time I could actually like get through a horror game as well. I actually beat that game. Um, the scariest moments are so atmospheric, but there are these long sections where you get like this whispery soundtrack that's really spooky, but there are no enemies in those sections. Mm. And that was what finally empowered me to just be like, oh, I can keep going through this. I can keep going through this. Yeah. And that was such a standard type of horror game. You know, in the same way that everything else was standardizing, Eternal Darkness was doing the same thing that Alone in the Dark and um, Silent Hill and Resident Evil were doing static camera angle up in the corner of a room. You walk around. Everything's kind of slow. Uh, you're not super nimble. That to me was just like, oh, it seems like every horror game is like this, but just not quite as good as Eternal Darkness. And just like the focus on survival rather than yeah. running guns, sort of destroying all things. Well, and to the, the point of Silent Hill, I remember and us yeah. playing Silent <laughs> Hill Shattered Memories. Yes. Oh, yeah. For uh, the Wii. Which, which was like the weird remake question mark of the OG Silent right, Hill that right. would yeah. focus more on like and the, the bad guys were like these pink little these pink guys. I, I think what I remember most about any game that I play plays that I see I would just like any piece of media typically yeah is the setting the just scenic design mm -hmm. and so especially that game that really sticks with me just the feeling of and like the sound effect too of like everything icing over thing you know it, everything kind of like you you have to retrace your steps then to like escape right. the cursed area or whatever and so things do change a little bit you know just enough to like throw you off and uh it make it yeah just like that added element of horror of like this place is no longer familiar and i'm running from these titted monsters <laughs> it, it's like it's not just choices right that that that's what makes shattered memories so interesting even though it's not a huge variety of things that happens, it's more about like focus. It's more right. about like things that you do without realizing that you're doing them affecting the way the game turns out. So rather out. than focus on you're making deliberate choices yeah. that are leading do to things changing. Do you kill the widow or do you not kill the widow? But that was the whole gimmick too, I remember, was it was like, this game will psychologically profile you oh, as you it, play yeah. it. You like, there's a moment, right? Are you talking to like the psychologist mm -hmm. and you, you have That's Rorschach right. yeah. uh, tests? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Like that, that was the whole idea of the game is like it, maybe it's supposed to be like tailored to scare you even more because it's playing into it your anxiety. More what you than yeah. you do. Yeah. And it's just like, how much tits do you like? <laughs> uh, we might as well get from here to Doki Doki Literature yeah. Club, which was uh, a, really a, a, a more or less single man product. I mean, he got some people to help him out, but, but yeah, more or less. Yeah. It, like it's it's a largely one guy operation. Dan Salvato, and he was a he was a modder. It was sort of like Toby Fox with Undertale, where he had made like mod, but not like Toby Fox in that these were not story mods. He was working on mechanical mods for Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Yeah, on what was it called, Project M? Yeah, he was mm -hmm. to make it play more like Melee, like a big, big uh, fighting game community guy in the Smash scene. That's so fascinating that then he makes a game. That's using basically an engine that hands everything to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a visual novels are kind of programming wise, the simplest thing that you can do. Right. But he actually comes from this programming background. Well, and that allows him to do some fun and unexpected things with the engine. Yeah. Uh, wh where does this idea come from exactly? Because I was I was looking at interviews with him. It just seems like he just kind of it just kind of came to him one day. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'll just make a visual novel. I mean, part of it is if, if you play through the whole game and you get to the so-called good ending where you've sort of explored and seen all of the different story paths that the game has to offer. Yeah. He does have a note at the yeah. very end that you yeah. can read and it sort of says, I actually think I want to read it here real quick because I think this really does speak to how he thought about this game and the effect that it wanted to have. And maybe toward the end, what we can do is talk about the extent to which it achieved these goals. Yeah. Yeah. To the special player who achieved this special ending. For years, I have been enamored by the ability of visual novels and games in general to tell stories in ways not possible using traditional media. Doki Doki Literature Club is my love letter to that. Games are an interactive art. Some let you explore new worlds. Some challenge your mind in brand new ways. Some make you feel like a hero or a friend, even when life is hard on you. Some games are just plain fun, and that's okay, too. Everyone likes different kinds of games. People who enjoy dating sims may have a heightened empathy for fictional characters, or they might be experiencing feelings that life has not been kind enough to offer them. If they are enjoying themselves, 
then that's all that matters. That goes for shooting games, casual games, sandbox games, anything. Preferences are preferences, and our differences are the reason we have a thriving video game industry. My own favorite games have always been ones that challenge the status quo. Even if not a masterpiece, any game that attempts something wildly different may earn a special place in my heart. Anything that further pushes the limitless bounds of interactive media. I extend my true gratitude to all those who have taken the time to achieve full completion. I hope you enjoyed playing it as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you for being a part of my literature club. Love, Dan Salvato. When I read this, I actually thought about you, Anne, because you have talked with me in the past about, you know, fan fiction and writing characters Mm. and thinking about characters and the way that fictional characters can actually become a really important part of your life. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, I remember it's funny because I I remember like one conversation that we were having about all of that, we had gone to, was it Game Con? Wasn't it Flame Con? Yeah, the the like gay uh, comic con, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New York, well, last year at some point. Yeah. And, and I think we were talking about, like you were sort of coming from the perspective of like, well, what's the point? Like a, a character is in a specific story to serve a specific function that is like if it's existing outside of that story, then like, that's not, that's not what it's there for. And they're like, why? (laughs) Um, And I was, uh, yeah, I I, I come from a very different sort of uh, way of thinking about that, I think. And one reason why I really love, you know, uh, stories, I'm less, interested in obviously like the story and the plot and everything like the story itself has to actually be good but i'm always more interested in who these characters are and just like understanding them as people and how their brains work and and whatever um but i think that it can be really fun and especially and then in the context of that con that we had just gone to um especially like understanding characters maybe who are queer or or queering characters. And I know, you know, people have very strong feelings about like yeah. <laughs> making a character queer who is like not necessarily canonically queer or whatever, but like. But I mean, that goes all the way back to Star Trek at yeah. least, yes. you oh, know, yeah, like is Kirk like the, and Spock the is, the, that... is the original slash. Yes. Fic. Yeah. Yes. The, the original slash. Uh, and we love them for it. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think just having characters that then you know if you're writing fan fiction or or maybe you're modding you know like people yeah. are, are modding heavily um additional scenes for doki doki but like to continue to explore and understand who these characters are um using that potentially as an outlet to um work through maybe consciously or subconsciously some of your own things or, or thinking you know especially then if 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 we're talking about queering characters yeah. or like like for myself in college like <laughs> part of my queer awakening was reading <laughs> bbc sherlock fanfic oh yeah before yeah. i realized really fully that i was queer because i was like looking up like john watson and his one like love interest and whatever i'm like oh, that's so strange there aren't a lot of stories with them together but huh there seem to be a lot of stories with John and Sherlock together. <laughs> That's odd. That's not in the story. And then it was like, oh, oh no. I'm discovering a terrible truth about myself. That was something I was not expecting from Doki Doki Literature Club. Yeah. Is that like, I thought, okay, this is going to be a satire. It's a mm-hmm. send up. It's like taking something that seems cute and friendly and fun, but it's just horror and it's kind of making fun of the whole concept and it's just not no not at all it's very sincere because this is someone who has played a lot of visual novels right and also just really likes a lot of games that turn them themselves on their own head right like mm-hmm. uh, Yume Nikki or, or like uh, Undertale yeah so he wants to be sincere in both sides of it that has uh, extended on to the fandom as well yeah right people people really love these characters and it's this is Hard for me to really understand, because I think Uh, in terms of this story, the characters are about as thin as they could possibly be. They exist in a world with no other people. Right. You know, you're you're like at school and at home. One character mentions having a dad and then otherwise, like no one has any family. It's just five people 
and that's it. Well, but I, I I think that's exactly why so many people grabbed onto to it and were like, I want to expand the story because I do think that you see flashes every now and then that point to something deeper in these characters. Mm-hmm. But by design, those things are only brief flashes. Now, if you play, uh, it, it's worth noting, we're going to be talking today about just the core game. Yeah, the original game, yeah. But there is also a Doki Doki Literature Club Plus, which includes six new side stories. These all take place sort of before the uh, story of the main game. And it does give you a much better sense of who these characters are, how they interacted with each other, and how the club came to be before the inciting event of the primary game, which, of course, is the introduction of the player character. See, and that's that's where I'm like, but we know who these characters are. They are exactly what's on the page here because that's what this story is written to be. Right. Th- th- this this game has been very friendly to the modding community. Uh, there are some very easy modding tools that are out there and people have made uh, an exasperating number of mods for this game. <laughs> Tons of stories on their own. And that's part of the criticism of the side stories of Doki Doki Plus mm. is that People are like, well, I came across some better side stories in in the fanfic. Right. Uh, and it's like, this isn't that. But it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, th- but this is the author. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like this shit's canon. Yeah. I, I don't know. What to do. I, I, I didn't. I, I played all of it yesterday. And so I did not have time uh, nor the desire to uh, play any of the, the mods. But I was looking them up. And it, yeah. I guess most recently, one of the mods it just has a bunch of pictures of like Wojax on it. <laughs> Hell yeah. And like uh, one of the characters appears to be skibbadeed and drawn inside of like a really crudely made toilet Great. it feels a lot like an old like new grounds yeah, collab yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, but that's i think maybe what the authorial intent would have mm. been if <laughs> if skibbity had you know been present if at the dan time. salvato were a zoomer yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's going to be a lot of very interesting freeware built around the concepts introduced by Skibbity Toilet in like 20 Jesus years. Christ. Oh, no. But uh, <laughs> I feel like we might as well get into the meat of the game now because, yeah. you know, we've got we've got an extra special treat for you today, listeners. We're going to be reading some bits from the game. We've got the scripts and, uh, you know, in, in this game, there's no voiceover. No, there are no voice actors. Again, this is a very until. small. Yeah, it's a very small <laughs> solo, basically solo operation. That was then also just released for free. Right. And is still ava- the, the original version is still available on itch.io for free. And it should be noted, something picked up in the first two months that it was out. I'm not exactly sure what. Maybe he made some content. You know, like, Salvato knows people. Mm-hmm. He was in the modding community. He's even made stuff for streamers, uh, streaming tools and things like that. So I, I think that's the other thing that made this game as big as it sure. was, was the streaming economy and people who are going to have an outsized reaction to things, sure. uh, regardless of what, it's just, ooh, oh, this is different. Bull! I'm going to scream yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the game also uh, knows when you're streaming. Uh, really? And there's even a, a comment that happens towards huh. the end that acknowledges that you're streaming That's the game. So I'm sure that got to a lot of people. But cool. three months in, uh, there had been a million downloads of this game. Uh, the next month, There had been another million downloads Uh, when Doki Doki Literature Club Plus released in about six months. It sold half a million copies. And in February of last year, it had reached uh, one million sales. And of course, the original download, you can you can tip as you make. Right. You you can get it for free or you can like leave a dollar or something. I'm sure plenty of people did. Um, So this has not made an insignificant amount of money in the end. Yeah. Dan, congrats on your millions. So this game starts the way that you would expect a typical Japanese or Japanese style visual novel to begin. You are headed off to school. You're walking to school because that's what you do when you don't live in America. (laughs) (laughs) And your next door neighbor, Sayori, comes out of the house and is ready to go to school with you. Hey! I see an annoying girl running toward me from the distance, waving her arms in the air like she's totally oblivious to any attention she might draw to herself. That girl is Sayori, my neighbor and good friend since we were children. You know, the kind of friend you'd never see yourself making today, but it just kind of works out because you've known each other for so long. We used to walk to school together on days like this, but starting around high school, she would oversleep more and more frequently, and I would get tired of waiting up. But 
If she's going to chase after me like this, I almost feel better off running away. However, I just sigh and idle in front of the crosswalk and let Sayori catch up to me. Ah, <sighs> ah, <sighs> I overslept again, but I caught up with you this time. Maybe, but only because I decided to stop and wait for you. Ah, uh, you say that like you were thinking about ignoring me. That's mean, Josh. Well, if people stare at you for acting weird, then I don't want them to think we're a couple or something. Fine, fine. You did wait for me after all. I guess you don't have it in you to be mean even if you want to. <laughs> Whatever you say, Sayori. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a classic walking to school this is, situation. This is certainly the kind of dialogue you get from a visual novel. <laughs> which is why I don't play visual novels. <laughs> like, sure is annoying girl. Like... It, I don't know. It's it's very flat. And again, it's it's sincere. This is sincere yeah. writing. He's not making yes. fun of how flat this is. He's just actually writing this. And this is a bit uh, difficult for me to get into. <laughs> honestly, it was a lot of work to keep my focus on this game okay. as I was playing through it until until the twist happened. Sure. I, I and am, then I thought it improved. I am curious because you were saying in your initial playthrough, you got through the first couple days and you were like, I had a no lost interest, whatever. Yeah. Were you waiting knowing that it was a horror game? Like, were you waiting? Yeah, for I the think twist so. Or, yeah, yeah, I was like, where is it, it going to go? And, and I a couple days I probably was lying there. I think I may have quit during the first uh, poem writing okay. part because I was yeah. like this. What's happening here? What's going on? And I think I might have been a little overwhelmed by the aspect of choice. And it's like, oh, I have to like try to tailor this to one of the three. And then there's going to be different branches for like mm -hmm. how that works. And it's really just like one branch each. The, the, right. the, the choices are like in most visual novels or, or in a lot of games with choice. Some choices are important. Some choices are just there to keep you right. engaged. And this has very few choices in general. You're just kind of advancing the dialogue most of the time. And we'll talk a little bit in a moment about the poetry uh, writing system, which is the only real mechanic in this game. Yeah. But before we get there, I'm curious, Anne, did you have a similar reaction to sort of this beginning here? Or yeah, just like, 100%. Good Lord, this anime <laughs> because, bullshit. Yeah, I don't know. There's something like I love anime. This is not a genre that I, you know, moe or whatever school girl, you know, yeah, whatever. Slice of life kind of stuff. I love slice of life okay. when it's really well written. Mm. And there are some really heartfelt, really, really beautiful stories. But like. Uh, yeah, this is not a story. This is not a type of writing that I I generally interact with anyway. And yeah. so I think my tolerance, yeah, is still in general, pretty low. Yeah. I just don't care. I I find it annoying. In general, I don't care about teens. Mm. I don't care about people's no. high school experiences. No. I don't give a fuck. You're on your own. Uh, <laughs> like just you'll get through it and you know, shut the fuck up. So Hey there, you are listening to a preview of a premium episode of The Worst of All Possible Worlds. If you'd like to listen to the rest of this, head on over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash worst of all. And you can listen to not only the rest of this episode, but our entire backlog of premium episodes, bonus episodes. And if you subscribe at the $10 tier, you will get an extra episode of the podcast every single month. Again, that is patreon.com slash worst of all. Hope to see you there.